James Bresnahan's legal story starts in 1964. Um, can you? It can actually, you, it actually starts earlier than that. <laughs> probably but, starts when he was born. Yeah, almost. Uh, tell us, nine. tell us uh, when he was born. That's in, right. In, well, in, in a <clears throat> narrative form, who, who James Bresnahan was okay. and who he is today. Uh, James Bresnahan is uh, a man who, when he was a boy at age 15, uh, killed his mother and father. And he was convicted on pleas of guilty, being represented by a lawyer hired by his maternal grandfather. And he was sent to state prison at, at age 15. Uh, I'll get back to some of the details in a moment, but I was public defender and I wasn't allowed to handle any other uh, criminal cases. But uh, what happened is that uh, his father was a physician and his father had uh, quite a bit of life insurance. He had listed his wife as the beneficiary, the principal beneficiary, and as uh, uh, secondary beneficiaries, his children. Uh, Jim, Jim being the oldest, and then a brother and a sister who were toddlers. Uh, the Prudential Insurance Company had this money and they looked at the proceedings that had caused uh, Jimmy to go to the state prison and felt that uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't an airtight case and that if they were to, uh, under under the law, uh, the, if somebody kills an insured, they cannot recover the proceeds. So if he were guilty of murder, he would not receive this, this money. But if the conviction were set aside, uh, he, he would have a legitimate claim to it. So the Prudential Insurance Company did what insurance companies frequently do in situations like that. They filed what's called an interpleader action and they take the proceeds of the insurance, they deposit it in the court, and they advise the court that the following facts are, uh, this father, the, the doctor died, was murdered, the mother was murdered, uh, the oldest son at age 15 was convicted, and there are uh, other two other siblings, a, a son and a daughter who are one and two, very, very tiny. Uh, we don't know if, if the conviction set aside, we would end up having to pay twice, so we want the court to decide who gets the money. That's what an interpleader action is. Well, the judge uh, in this court, Hatfield Chilson, appointed uh, a lawyer by the name of Ted Woods, uh, Wood, uh, uh, Ted Wood, who uh, was the recently retired senior partner of an insurance law firm, Woodris and Haynes. And uh, he knew him quite well, and uh, Judge Chilson did. And he said, I have a matter I'd like you to take up as an officer of the court. And he said, there's no fee in it. There's it's a, an interpleader action, but I'd like you to uh, uh, be the guardian for this boy who's in prison and file a report. And he says, it will take you uh, uh, undoubtedly a trip to Breckenridge where the court records are and to Canyon City to interview him and then come back and file a report. And so uh, uh, Ted Wood said he would do it. And the first thing he did was go to Breckenridge and the judge, uh, state judge wouldn't allow him to see the file. And because uh, he, he said he didn't care what the federal court wanted. It was not, uh, he, did, he wasn't an attorney in the case and he couldn't see it. Uh, that judge didn't like lawyers from Denver under any circumstance. but. At any rate, he went down to Canyon City to see the boy, and he wouldn't talk to him. So This is Jimmy Bresnahan. This is Jimmy Bresnahan. So he came back to uh, Denver, and he reported to Judge Chilson that he, he couldn't do anything about this uh, because the judge wouldn't let him and, uh, see the records, and uh, the boy wouldn't talk to him. Well, <clears throat> at the same time that he was talking to Jimmy in jail, there was another prisoner there who I had represented as public defender, uh, a guy by the name of, <coughs> excuse me, 
a guy by the name of George Robert Gorski. And uh, Gorski was a, a, a great character. I can tell you more about him later, but uh, uh, Gorski, I had been successful in getting his sentence cut from 16 years down to eight. So he thought that I was a miracle worker. And uh, so he tells Jimmy, he says, well, you need to call John Kane. And he says, write him a postcard. And Jimmy says, I don't want to talk to anybody. He says, this guy can help you. And he says, I'll even pay the dime for the stamp for the postcard. So Ted Woods comes back down again to Canyon City to see Jimmy. And uh, uh, Jimmy says, the only person I'll talk to is John Kane. So Ted came back and he uh, asked around if anybody knew who I was, et cetera. And some people knew about me being the public defender. And so he called and asked me to come down to the Denver club where I'd never been uh, for lunch. And I, I did, and he asked me if I would come in on the case. And I said, well, I can't, uh, I'm public defender. I'm not allowed to have any criminal cases. He said, well, can you, can you try? He said, I want you to represent me as the guardian. And uh, so, you know, arguably it's not a criminal case. It's a, a habeas corpus, which technically is a civil case. So I said, well, I, I'll need to talk to the county commissioners. And I went back to Brighton and I asked for a meeting with them and I did. And I told them what the situation was. And I was very surprised. They thought it was the greatest thing in the world. They were flattered that the Adams County was looking so good that a federal judge would want somebody from Adams County working on this case. So they said, by all means do. And uh, so I agreed to uh, represent Ted Wood. And we went down to Canyon City and I talked with uh, Jimmy and we started in an investigation. And as I say, Judge Luby wouldn't allow us to see anything. We finally were allowed to see the court files. And then uh, we asked to see the probation report and he wouldn't let us. So I initiated a uh, mandamus proceeding in the Colorado Supreme Court and got an order that we could see it. And we did that. And uh, then we went uh, and filed a motion, and it was very difficult to do. Uh, the judge was very angry, and Ted was trying to argue it as the older person there. And uh, Judge Luby at one point threatened him with uh, sanctions, and uh, he said, you're inter interfering with justice. And he kept saying, I'm not. I'm doing what Judge Chilson wants. Well, this isn't a federal court, you know. He got a lot of that kind of parochialism, but uh, at any rate, uh, we, we had to go back up to uh, the Supreme Court again and get another mandamus. And then uh, we, we, set, we tried to get a hearing and he kept denying us a hearing. And he would do things like uh, say, well, you didn't file a notice to set. We'd have to be in Denver mail a notice to set to Breckenridge and then drive up, at which point the clerk would then give us a hearing and then we'd go before the judge on another date. It was just this effort to make everything as difficult as, as possible. Now, during this time, the, the district attorney up there, a man named Gene Lorick, was concerned enough that a 15-year-old boy is charged with murdering his parents that he, uh, he called the Colorado Psychiatric Hospital and they sent two residents up to Breckenridge or to Leadville where the jail was, where he was being held. And, uh, and they interviewed uh, Jimmy while he, before he had pled guilty. He, uh, the, the two residents filed a report and they said that they felt that uh, an insanity plea was viable because uh, of the battered child syndrome. And that sent the uh, tenured faculty in charge of forensic psychiatry into orbit. The, the director of psychiatry there, John McDonald, was uh, uh, incensed that they would say this. Uh, and and the, the reason is this. The examination was based on, on Jimmy being a battered child, 
which I'll go into in a moment. But the battered child syndrome was not at that point an accepted part of medical science. C. Henry King, uh, C. Henry Kemp, Kemp uh, had started the instruction and research on the battered child syndrome, and he had uh, 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 cooperated with a, uh, a psychoanalyst uh, at, at the faculty, uh, and they had formulated the battered child syndrome, and basically what had happened is the pediatrician, Dr. Kemp, had looked at all these x-rays of injured children, and he would see old, line, old fracture lines, and that indicated how can you have that many fractures, and so he he continued his investigation and found that these children were battered. And then he got the psychoanalyst, uh, Brant Steele was his name, to look at the, the psychoanalytic aspects of the battered child syndrome. And the two of them came out and formulated this. But it was being circulated at uh, various medical uh, conventions and so forth and being published, the peer review literature, it had not yet been accepted as, an, uh, as a valid doctrine in uh, medicine. So the Department of Psychiatry at CU was very uh, noticeably uh, in disagreement over Freud. There was the, the psychoanalytic psychiatrists and then there were the old classification type that did not believe in the Freudian approach. And the two of them fought all the time. Well, the director of forensic psychiatry, Dr. McDonald, was of the old school who rejected Freud. Brant Steele was of the Freudian school, in fact, had known Freud. Uh, and so they fought all the time. Well, what McDonald did was call in these two residents and say, if you insist on pursuing this, he says, he said, the Department of Psychiatry will disavow it and I will recommend that your residencies be terminated. So we had evidence that we couldn't use. Evidence that in effect had been withdrawn and that was not part of an acceptable, recognized medical doctrine to, to say, look, he was insane, he pled guilty, the insanity pleas have to, or the uh, guilty pleas have to be set aside, and he has to be rearranged, and we can enter the insanity plea, etc. That was our strategy. So we reported back to Judge Chilson, and uh, it was very interesting. Uh, Ted Wood said, uh, "Well, he said this is not insurance law." He said, "And John's doing the job. I don't really need to be there anymore." And Chilson said, "Oh no, I want you there. I want you." And I says, "I want John to continue to be representing." you as the guardian ad litem. So uh, till the day he died, Ted was working on that case uh, with me. Now, at, at about this time, I, uh, uh, I, I was heading toward the, my, toward the Peace Corps. And so we didn't have a hearing yet in the Bresnahan case. And Don McDonald, who I mentioned earlier, was at CU, and he had gone into practice in Denver. And uh, so I asked him to come in on the case, and he did. And then McDonald and I worked together, and then when I went to the Peace Corps, uh, McDonald went to Ted Wood, and he said, uh, I need help, and uh, another lawyer, Dale Tooley, is going to run for district attorney, but he doesn't have any criminal law background, and he wants some, and he wants to come in on this case. And Ted Wood said, fine. So for the two years that I was gone, they were dealing with this case, and they had to make another trip to the Supreme Court. I can't recall what that one was about. But uh, eventually they had the trial, and I came back, and uh, when I came back from my Peace Corps tour, uh, I contacted McDonald and Ted Wood, and they said, well, we had a hearing, but uh, Judge Louis has never never reached a verdict. And so there this was- This is a hearing on whether or not- uh, It was a full the trial. Plea, the guilty plea was, should be withdrawn and right. he should be allowed to plead insanity. Right, and he had never ruled 
the, the basis of it was that he was denied competent counsel because counsel should have seen to it that a 15-year-old with a battered child syndrome could plead not guilty by reason of insanity. And so this lawyer who was from Cheyenne along with uh, Jimmy's maternal father-in-law had been hired by him, had come down. And uh, my recollection is that uh, this lawyer told Jimmy that if he wanted to, uh, there was a possibility of his entering insanity pleas, but if he did, he would spend the rest of his life in an insane asylum, and plus the fact that even if he was found not guilty by reason of insanity, his, his grandparents would have to sell their house and lose all their money in order to pay for it. And so Jimmy said I, he didn't want any of that, and so he pled guilty. So there was some question of the methods used to extract a plea from him. Uh, at any rate, they had the hearing, Judge Luby never decided, so I said, well, mandamus again, we go up because there's a Colorado statute that says that if a judge has held a case under advisement for, I can't remember the time, but X number of months and doesn't decide it, you, you can, upon complaint, have his pay withheld. It's 12 months. Is it 12 months? Okay. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I said, let's file that. So I prepared the, the uh, mandamus proceedings and I went to, uh, the, it was in the state capitol building. This was before the judicial building was built. But I went over there and I was uh, walking in and the state capitol had a coffee shop in the in the ground floor as you walked in uh, without going up the big steps, sort of a basement, they had a, a coffee shop and uh, Eddie, Chief Justice Pringle was there. So he said, oh, when did you get back? And I told him, you know, a couple of months or something. And, and what are you doing now? And I told him and I said, what do you got there? And I said, oh, I said, it's another Bresnahan mandamus petition. And he looks at me and he says, let me see it. And I handed it to him and he said, you know, he said, we don't need all this bad publicity. He said, let me call Luby. He said, can you withhold filing it for a week or so? And uh, he says, I'll call him and tell him that he has to decide the case. So I said, sure. So I left and Judge Pringle contacted Judge Luby and then uh, I think it was Pringle's assistant, Harry Lawson, who called me and said, the chief has talked to Luby and he gave him 30 days to come out with his decision, or he would impose the salary thing. So on the 29th day, Luby resigned, retired from office. And never wrote? Never wrote it. So uh, they took the file, transcripts and everything, and they gave it to uh, another judge. And the other judge was Dan Shannon, who was a, a good judge. He was in Jefferson County. But uh, all he had was the record, and Luby wouldn't allow any information to come in. So the record was, was, was one that wasn't probative of the issues. And uh, he said, I have to deny it on the basis of this record. But he said, I, I'm going to include my opinion that I think that you should appeal this because uh, the record is inadequate. So we said, okay. And, so we filed a notice of appeal and uh, it went to the Colorado Supreme Court one more time and they uh, denied relief. And so we came over here to federal court and this all had taken uh, 10 years. So Jimmy was now no longer a 15 year old kid, he was 25. And I'll tell you about his background and what he did later. But at any rate, we appeared in front of Judge Fred Winter and uh, Winter was fascinated with the case. And he said, well, he said, it still isn't the law that uh, the, the battered child syndrome is a recognized, uh, accepted within the medical community. We said, that's right, uh, it isn't, but it's not rejected either. It's being deliberated at this stage. And he says, well, you're gonna have to take that to the Court of Appeals. So he denied it. And so I turned to Jimmy, who was president of the court, and I said, looks like we're going up to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. And uh, he said, wait a minute. He said, can I talk to you? And I said, yes. And, and uh, uh, poor old Ted Wood was there. And he said, I just want to talk to you alone. And I said, okay. And so 
Ted left and two guys from the Colorado Attorney General's office left. And I was just at the council table with him and uh, I think the guard was over at the corner watching. But he looked at me and he said, uh, he said, I've been in there for 10 years. He said, I have taken every single course that's available to me while a prisoner. He said, I have worked in the lab doing hematology. And he said, I've received an A in every course I've taken. And he said, I can't do anything more. But he says, can you get me a commutation? And he looked at me and he said, you know, even if you win this, he said, all it means is that the money that's on deposit with the court would go to, to me, and, or a third of it would go to me instead of to my brother and sister. And he says, I wouldn't accept it anyway. It should all go to them. And I'm over 21 and I'm willing to sign whatever it is to let them have it. So he said, but can you get me a commutation? And I said, well, I, I can't guarantee it, but I could try. So rather than appeal, we, I, I was at Home Roberts by this time, and rather than appeal, uh, I prepared a, uh, a petition for the governor uh, to uh, commute his sentence. And John Vanderhoof was a Republican, was the uh, governor, and he had been defeated by uh, Dick Lamb. And I worked and worked to get this in front of Vanderhoof, and it was his last day in office. This I, is 19, I, 1975 now. I finally got an appointment <coughs> with him, and I went in, and he looks at it, and he I knew him because my dad had served with him in the legislature. Uh, and I had also contacted my partner, Ted Stockmar, who was a, a, a not notable Republican who knew Vanderhoof quite well, and had Vanderhoof, or had uh, Stockmar make the appointment for me. So he looks at it and he's, yeah, 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 and he picks up the paper and he reads it like this and he says, I am not going to have my last official act being uh, one where I free some murderer. He said, we'll just leave that on the desk and let little Dickie Lamb take care of it when he gets sworn in tomorrow. So that's what he did. Well, I knew, uh, I knew Lamb. We'd taken the bar at the same time and I, I knew him as a lawyer and uh, so on. So I said, okay. I filed it again and this time uh, Lamb was getting organized uh, in his office, and he had a, a person helping him who I would refer to, I don't know if this is true or not, but I would call a dollar a year man. It was a, a guy that was helping him out, and so on was Jeremy Seamus. And I don't think Seamus was on the payroll because Seamus didn't need to be, but at any rate, he was helping out. And so Lamb had given this Bresnahan issue to him and he came to see me and he said, uh, I've got to look at the file and everything. And I said, I've got it all and, and so on. And uh, so then he said, uh, uh, Governor Lamb says that he recalls Dale Tooley had something to do with this. And by this time, Tooley was district attorney. So I said, yeah, he did. And I said, if, you, uh, if you're gonna see him, I said, tell him I've got all the files and whatever he needs, I'll be happy to uh, give to him. So uh, he said, okay. And then he, a couple of days later, he called and he said, well, I've seen Tooley, and he says, I have some bad news for you. And uh, I said, what are you talking about? I said, he hasn't called, he hasn't asked for anything. And so I met with Seamus, and Seamus says, well, he said, Tooley says that it's not a good idea for Lamb being a brand new governor. It's politically unwise to take on a controversy like this at the beginning of his uh, administration and he should at least wait a while before he decides it. And uh, I said, okay. I said, that's what Tooley told you? He said, yeah. And I said, well, I said, will you deliver a message to Lamb for me? And he said, sure. I said, you tell him that Jimmy Bresnahan has spent 12 years, I think it was, in, in prison uh, under uh, very unjust circumstances. And I've spent the last 12 years trying to get him out, and I will spend the next 12 years if necessary. But I will spend the next 
50 years if it takes it to see that Dale Tooley is disbarred. He was this man's lawyer and he has just said that to you and I said that's grounds in my view for disbarment. So as uh, Seamus told me later, he kind of laughed about it and he said, uh, well, okay. And he went in to see Lamb and told him what Tooley had said and he says, oh, by the way, he said, uh, he said, Kane was really angry and he said, this is what he said. He said, I, I don't place much stock in it. And Lamb said, you don't know him, I do. <laughs> he said, uh, you tell John that I will grant the commutation on one condition. This is the end of it, no more. And so Seamus told me and I said, I've got a client, that's the end of it, okay. So that was the end, he signed the commutation. Jimmy went to, uh, was transferred over to Pueblo. So was he commuted to a term certain? He was commuted to a, a term of 10 years to life which made him automatically eligible for uh, release from the tenure, but he'd served 12 already. But he got the second degree commutation, so he could go up to life, but he was still serving his sentence. But they transferred him because he'd already done the minimum. He was eligible to be a trustee by their uh, regulations. And he went over to Pueblo where he worked in the lab doing blood tests, and somehow he got some old bicycle parts and put them together and he enrolled at uh, uh, what was then called the University of Southern Colorado and uh, uh, now it's what Colorado State University at Pueblo or something but he went there and again he got straight A's and he took every course he could that would fit into his schedule so he even had courses like one was introduction to children's literature in the education department because that's all he could fit in on that schedule. But he took all these other courses and uh, then he got, uh, uh, I was appointed to the bench. No, I'm sorry, no, he, he was commuted and uh, he came up to uh, Denver and he, he lived with me and with my wife and uh, children. The two older ones were, were living there at the time. So he was paroled after his commutation? He was paroled after the commutation and he was in Denver and during all of his education in the state prison and in the, while he was at the state hospital, he was unable to take a course in physics or another one in calculus. So he, he enrolled at Regis University and he went over there, I, we lived in East Denver, but he went over there every day and, and he took uh, calculus and uh, physics. And uh, I had at the time uh, a client, uh, at, I was at Home Roberts, I was representing a very famous and wonderful uh, transplant surgeon by the name of Thomas Starzl, who had uh, at that time was the leading world surgeon on kidney transplants and later started doing total heart and lung transplants. But at that point, he was uh, doing kidney transplants. So I called uh, Dr. Starzl on the phone, and I said, uh, I've got this guy, and he works in a lab, and he knows blood tests and all that. And I said, do you have a place for him? And he said, sure. And he used a term I'd never heard before. He says, oh, he says we, need, we always need a deaner. And deaner is a word used in a lab for the guy that moves the test tubes around and cleans things up. Sort of, I always thought it was like Igor in the <laughs> Frankenstein movie. But at any rate, he got that job, and I told uh, uh, Dr. Starzl that Brant Steele and Henry Kemp knew all about Jim. So he sees Brant Steele, and Steele says, well, if he wants to, I'll be happy to, to treat him and give him some uh, therapy while he's trying to readjust. And so he saw Steele and he worked for Starzl and uh, see Henry Kemp and there was another doctor out there, I think his name was Archer or Arthur, something like that. But Jimmy applied for med school and they got him in. And he went to uh, med school and he- uh, CU Med School? CU Med School at Denver. And he, uh, he financed that by uh, signing up with the US Public Health Service. And like the military, uh, 
they will pay for somebody to go to med school and for every year of med school they spend a year in service and so the public health service does that as well and he did that and then when he uh, when he graduated uh, he did a combined internship fellowship in internal medicine at St. Joseph Hospital in Denver and then he went to work for the public health service uh, to uh, try to abbreviate this is so difficult but at any rate when he was in the prison uh, it was the uh, Spanish speaking the Hispanics in the prison who protected him as a 15 year old boy so that he wouldn't be raped and uh, molested by the uh, the other inmates and they protected him and so he learned to speak Spanish and he swore that if he ever got out, he was going to devote his life to helping these people because they had saved his life. So he went to the public health service and essentially volunteered, went to the uh, San Joaquin County Hospital in the San Joaquin Valley, and he spent his career uh, treating migrant farm workers. And while doing so, he, uh, realized that their principal medical problem was uh, gastrointestinal, uh, a lot from alcohol and the kind of diet they had, but they were getting ulcers and stomach cancers and other gastrointestinal problems. So he applied for a fellowship at Long Island Hospital in Brooklyn in gastroenterology, and they admitted him for this program but New York would not give him uh, uh, permission, a, a medical license, because he had a felony conviction. So I was on the bench. I couldn't do anything about that. And I called my friend Mike Kanjus, who was very familiar with all this. We're in probably 1979 now. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And so uh, Kanjus went to, then it was Governor Roy Romer, and he got a pardon for him. And uh, Governor Romer uh, made some marvelous statements about, you know, this. at 15 he's a murderer sentenced for life, and now at his age he's a uh, highly respected specialist in medicine and wants to go further and become further specialized, and, and he deserves it. So he said he's an example for all of us, and uh, he granted the pardon. And uh, Jimmy went to uh, Long Island, and he uh, got his whatever postdoctoral certification in gastroenterology, and then he went back to the San Joaquin County Hospital and practiced there until he retired. And uh, he retired just a couple of years ago, and he now is living uh, part of the year in uh, uh, in Fresno and part of the year in Denver. And you and your wife and he and his wife are friends to this day. Oh, very, very much so, yeah. Um, when you were sworn in as a uh, federal judge in, I think, 19, late 1977. Yes. Um, he was living in your house, as I recall. Yes, he was. Uh, and did that become a, a subject of some press yeah, there notoriety was a, at the time? There was a New York uh, Times reporter by the name of Molly Ivins who is from Texas. She's the one who, uh, uh, with uh, George W. Bush, uh, uh, called him shrub, and was the one that coined that phrase for him. So she, Molly Ivins was, I guess, very well known. She's passed away as well. But uh, she wrote an article that was in the New York Times that said something about President Jimmy Carter is appointed a judge, and no other judge can make this statement that has a convicted first-degree murderer living in his house. And it, she wrote this story. There was a, quite a bit of publicity about it. Uh, I mean, it, it, his story is profound, and your experience with him is profound. Um, we'll talk about sentencing practices more when we get into yeah. your 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 uh, judicial career. But I, I wonder whether uh, do you have any observations about? How that experience uh, sort of shaped your sentencing philosophy? Well, yeah, it, it shaped a lot of things with me. Uh, first of all, it, uh, that case was badly handled from the very beginning. 
and uh, the the law at that time has changed with an expert could now come into court whether it's accepted or not by the scientific community and say I've done the research and this is what I say and it could be brought forward but in those days it couldn't it had to be in order to be admissible it had to be considered to be orthodox doctrine so th that was bad uh, at the time and the other thing is that there one of the things that I paid attention to is and I think I got a lot of this from my conversations with uh, Dr. Brant Steele, the psychoanalyst. But when people are dealing with what is objectively referred to as parenticide, that they have a, almost everyone has a deep-seated fear of this. It's related to the Oedipus complex, the Electra complex, and parenticide uh, uh, is one of these unspoken, deeply subconscious fears that people have. And they hear of a child killing a parent and there's just horror attached to it. Well, if you pursue it and you understand why all of that is, the effect on my sentencing approach is it's consistent with my thought that you can't simply look at a statute and look at a report and put your thumb on it and say that's the sentence. You have to look at a sentence from every possible perspective and that includes the victims and the fears that they might have or what the victims may have done that unintentionally has or intentionally has, has helped to create this terrible situation. You have to look at the defendant and uh, the uh, friends, the education, uh, the, uh, the health, physical and mental of all of these people. And you have to look at society at large and see what's going on with the publicity that surrounds these things. The Bresnan case was highly, highly publicized. And that did not help him. People would read it and say, oh, you know, why aren't they executing him? Oh, you can't execute anybody under the age of 18. Well, then he should spend the rest of his life in prison. End of story. And it wasn't. It wasn't. End of story. And we didn't know so much about it. I learned a tremendous amount about the battered child syndrome and about the struggle that scientists had at that time, and I think still do to some extent, to get their findings and their, their theories that are in that are advancing knowledge and to get those things accepted. And it's very, very difficult. People are entrenched with no, notions and, and parenticide is one of them. And it affects judges just as much as it does anybody else. So when you talk about it, uh, there's an immediate response of, uh, even if it isn't a vis uh, an identifiable response, there's a subconscious reaction to the idea of parenticide. And so that, that had a, a big effect on me. The other effect is that, you know, it's a shame that one person with his intelligence and his drive uh, and dedication was able to overcome tremendous brutality. He suffered psychological battering and physical battering as a child to be driven to that point and then to come out of it and to dedicate his life, rehabilitation is, is always a, a possibility. But the other thing you have to look at as a judge is to look and see the abject failure of our punitive prison system. Because what was he doing there in the first place? He shouldn't have been there. As ever. a 15-year-old? As a 15-year-old, he should never have been there. He should have been taken over to the state hospital he should have received the therapy he needs in the one or two years and been out. And I know that for a fact because I had another case with a 15-year-old boy that murdered a nine-year-old girl. And only this time he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. And he went to Pueblo and uh, that, that had something to do with my appointment as a judge too because that particular case it was called uh, the, the little girl that was uh, killed was Paula Sue Steinbeck, 
and uh, it became the Colorado Press Association story of the year. So it was just, you know, inundated with news everywhere. Uh, but we were able to get him, and that's when I was public defender, and we got him down to uh, Pueblo, and he spent about a year there, and uh, most of the time lived in the house of the superintendent of the hospital, and received some therapy, and got out, and went back home, and was able to build a life again. And so uh, that kind of thing, I think, is what we need to look at. Is what uh, you know. I, I, I'll say one other thing, and then I'll answer your question. But the the idea pe you hear all the time, people saying, "I want justice for somebody." They, I want justice for, you know, whoever was killed. And they say, I want the prosecutor, I want justice for her. That's not justice, that's vengeance. Justice is balancing. That's what justice means, is to balance, to restore. And people are talking about they want justice all the time when they really mean they want revenge. They, they want a, a legitimate...